Well, thank you, Stinas, uh, and thank you for everybody uh, for coming here this ungodly hour. I think it's still early on a Saturday, actually. Um, and thanks very much for inviting me to this conference with uh, so many distinguished speakers. I'm, of course, a little bit disappointed that I couldn't be speaking on a Sunday at 10 o'clock in direct competition with the empty churches, but never mind. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> And of course, as you said, uh, I have a shady past as a neuroscientist that was in an earlier century, but still. Um, so I have something about the brain, and I would like to talk about this theory that religion is really just a cognitive parasite. And so how do we look at how this parasite is mutating, uh, and what does it teach us about where to be vigilant in, in the future? So, of course, I mean, there are different ways that you can look at religion. Uh, it has become, in the last 10, 15 years, okay to look at religion as a natural phenomenon. Of course, we know this from Dennett, Dawkins, and the others. Uh, it didn't used to be okay. There used to be this, uh, if you go back to, um, to Stephen Jay Gould, he would say that religion and, uh, and science are non-overlapping domains or magisteria, and they should just keep out of each other's business. Now, thank God, so to speak, uh, it has become okay to look at religion as a natural phenomenon, and it really is, of course, a natural phenomenon. Then, if, because if you look at it logically, uh, every human culture that we know of today and that we know of through history They've all had religion, different kinds of religions, but if you look at them, they all had it. Uh, and all these religions have common traits. So what does that say? That says to a biologist, okay, this cannot be a cultural phenomenon. It's not something that just grows out of culture. It's probably something that has biology in it somewhere. Then you can start to formulate theories about, so what kind of biology is, is, uh, is acting here? How, how does this phenomenon evolve? And then you have the uh, uh, evolutionary biologists who will say, well, religion is probably an adaptation. Because if you look at it, uh, the human race evolved on the African savanna. Uh, they were living in little groups. And if you imagine that a group suddenly discovers this phenomenon, religion, or uh, creates some kind of belief, it would create probably very strong social cohesion in this group. And such a group would be very strong in comparison to other groups. So when these little groups were fighting each other, uh, it would be an advantage to be in the group that had religion because of the cohesion. So whatever kind of genetic flaw this group had would spread in the population, and you would see religion as you see it today in every population because it was an ad adaptation. It was an evolutionary advantage. And you can go and read David Sloan Wilson's Darwin's Cathedral, where he argues this point. Then you have uh, another group of um, biologists who will say, no, it's not that religion is an, an adaptation. It wasn't a, an advantage as such in evolution. It's more like a, a side effect of the way that the brain has evolved. Um, the brain is such a an amazing apparatus that can do all these wonderful things like create beliefs, for example, just as a side effect. And then you have the group of cognitive religious scholars, uh, the group of cognitive religious um, studies that will say, well, it's, we can actually go and ask uh, and see what is it in the brain that makes religion such an, uh, an ubiquitous phenomenon. It is simply because the brain has evolved into this very, very social apparatus that the ideas, supernatural ideas, and that means religion as well as elves and as, you know, as well as um, Santa Claus and whatever, such ideas just have um, very, very strong tendency to sort of grab hold of our brains. It's very difficult not to believe in such ideas when we have a brain uh, that is created the, or evolved the way that it is. And Pascal Boyer, who's a, uh, an anthropologist and a psychologist who works at Washington University, uh, has written a great book called Religion Explained that gathers together a lot of um, 
evidence for this theory from anthropology, religious studies, biology, whatever. And I would recommend uh, everyone to go and read this book. Anyway, so the basis of the theory is that we should look at the, the human brain as a social machine. I mean, the human species is incredibly social. We have been called the hyper-social animal. Because in, in a way that is just, you know, so different from other social species, we have evolved, say, phenomena like theory of mind. We know that other people have a mind. We can think about what are other people thinking about me? What do they have? What kind of intentions do they have? Um, and, and we can do this in, in various degrees. Um, and it's when we have such a mind, it's simply very, very easy to latch on to various supernatural ideas. So our mind is really scanning for, uh, for different things in our environment all the time. Take purpose, for example. It's been said that religion appeals very much to us because we, we do need a, a purpose in life. But I, it's not really only that. It's, it's that purpose is one of those things that our brain is always scanning for. We can see it in little children. For example, the uh, American psychologist Deborah Kellerman uh, has done a lot of experiments with little kids from the age of four. And you can ask these children what are different things in life for? Like say, what is a lion for? And the kid will not say, that's an odd question, a lion is not for anything. No, the kid will say, oh, a lion is for you know, placing in a zoo so I can go see it. And a cloud is for, it's made for raining. And a tree is made for me to climb it. And that will continue up to the age of nine. And, and she calls it um, natural and promiscuous teleology. That we form these, we simply um, interpret the world as everything has a purpose for some reason. Um, and also, um, another thing that we keep, or our brain keeps looking for is, of course, causality. Because in evolutionary terms, you can imagine that thinking about things and finding out causalities behind things would be very, very uh, advantageous. So we constantly scan for causality. What is behind this stuff? What caused this stuff to, uh, to be as it is? And the same thing with intention. Again, our minds are always reading other people's minds, like what is the intention behind whatever this guy is doing? What is the intention behind what this woman thinks? And so on. And we all do this in a social context all the time. So we constantly think about agents. There must be agents behind things. There must be agents doing things. And if you look at gods, for example, you don't see any religion that has a god that isn't interested in human beings. You no, know, the gods always have very keen interests in us. And they have intentions for us and with us. And they know everything about us. And this is because our mind constantly is thinking in social terms. There must be someone behind whatever is out there in the world and, what, and, and behind what happens to us. Actually, our mind does not like chance and probability and statistics. We want causality, and we want purpose, and we want intentions. So basically, like I think it's Jesse Baring, who's a, a researcher in, um, in Belfast, has said once, it's really because these religious or supernatural ideas come so naturally to our, to our minds, to our brains, it's really hard work to be an atheist, because you constantly have to you know, shed these ideas that are so appealing. And that's, of course, all, also why Pascal Boyer came up with this um, expression that, that these ideas, religion, is like a parasite on our cognitive apparatus. Interestingly, when I talked to Boyer uh, a while ago, he said that he had given up talking about religion as a cognitive parasite because he would get so much, uh, so much hassle from religious groups in the US. So he doesn't say that anymore. But of course, he still thinks it. <laughs> 